He is risen. Amen. Amen. Wow. Welcome, friends and family, and each of you who's come. You're special to us. We're so glad you're here. The whole church family loves you and welcomes you already. I especially want to welcome uh, my new friend I met on Taco Tuesday down in the city, uh, Donnie Isaacson. Would you wave at us, Donnie? <laughs> welcome, Donnie. He feels, he feels the call to serve in government, and uh, I like the vision you have for uniting in a fractious day. So, thanks for coming, man. The resurrection story. The youngest disciple was John. Jesus loved him. It was like Jesus' favorite, his bestie. That didn't seem fair to the others, but John didn't care. They were in like a life group together with James, his brother, and Peter, those three. They were kind of the posse inside the posse, the 12 disciples. But these three were special to Jesus, and John was the youngest of them. Jesus just gave John more. Jesus gave John charge of his mother while he was hanging on a cross. Jesus gave John a vision that completes the Bible. We call it a revelation. Today we're using story and theology from John's gospel and John's revelation. And then we're going to use a conclusion, a concluding passage from Paul. Let's pray. Lord, this story is being shared throughout the globe today in settings like this, also in settings of groups gathered under a tree or in a home or in a coffee shop. We thank you that 2,000 years later, this story is as alive as it's ever been. And we pray you use it in our lives today in this room. And everyone said... Amen. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. I'm in John 20. The first 10 verses. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. Every time John writes the other guy, he's talking about himself in the Gospel of John. And then he says it, the one Jesus loved. <laughs> the special one. <laughs> but she's running to Peter and John who were part of that inner leadership group. And she says to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where he is. We don't know where his body is. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but, but didn't go in. Then Simon, Peter, came along. He was a few decades older, so he was a little slower. And he went straight into the tomb and saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who'd reached the tomb first also went inside. See, John was probably still a teenager and wondering what is going on. John saw and he believed. They still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. You see, all the others still didn't understand. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. 
Jerusalem, some of you have been to the old city. It's not very big. It's easy to walk the whole city. So it wasn't far. It was dark when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Still dark. (laughs) They were confused. Think about it. The one they'd been with as teacher, as friend, as rabbi. For some of them, he was actually their brother, James, Jude. They were probably part of the team now. Early on, they had thought he was out of his mind, but by this point in Jesus' ministry, they were, they were part of the team. They weren't in the 12, but they were in the 120 that were probably there in the city together. It wasn't just the 12 that at this point were following. It was the 12 that were being set up for leadership, but there were many that were part of the team at this point. They were confused. Imagine, you think you're going to be part of a revolution of some kind, and it's over. Two days. He's arrested Thursday night after the Seder meal. He's tortured. He's hung on a cross and executed. The vision seems like it's up in a puff of smoke. I don't know, maybe you're like me and sometimes you feel in the dark. You might be feeling in the dark right now in your life. John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, so on the evening of the first day of that week is Sunday, the same Sunday morning when in the dark Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. It's the same day. But they were gathered with the doors locked for fear. The doors are locked because of fear of the Jewish leaders. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace, shalom, be with you. He's standing among a a whole group of Jewish friends, but they were fearful of the ones that were in power in the city who had partnered with Pontius Pilate and the Roman government to execute Jesus. And they were afraid we too are going to be arrested. They're living in fear. They're living in fear. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in the moment, in the meeting. And he speaks to them, peace, peace. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed, and the disciples were overjoyed because now they realized he was alive. He was different, but he was alive. He had a physical body that had spiritual dimensions. He could just show up in the room, and yet they could recognize him. They could feel the scars. They could see he was Jesus. <laughs> Before he shows up, they're paralyzed. They're overwhelmed. Maybe, maybe your life is paralyzed. Maybe anxiety has filled your heart. Maybe not today, but sometimes seasons like that come. I know for me, last Monday was one of those days. It's kind of an anxious day for me. I, we had spent a couple of hours, several hours, looking for a new apartment downtown. The building we live in has three units in it, and we've been there for a couple of years. Enjoy it, love it. We're on Mulberry. We can see down the skyscape over the city. It's really beautiful. It's an easy walk from here, about a mile. It's easy from here because it's downhill. It's a hard walk from there here. (laughs) But we were discouraged because everything has gotten even more expensive for less space. And we're looking at things downtown, and there's kind of cool stuff, like cool workout rooms and amenities and, you know, the apartment in the sky, kind of like the Jeffersons. We're moving on up. (laughs) But we like it where we are, and we didn't want to move, but the the owners decided to sell sell every unit in the building. They didn't want to sell the building, which maybe we would have thought about having, and then we'd lease the other two apartments, but they sold each as a condo, and now it's kind of like 
Airbnb Central, and that's not a lot of fun. So we didn't want to buy our unit. So we were just anxious because there's a lot going on in our lives. You know, anybody else here feeling busy lately? <laughs> and then you have to think about moving. Anybody else having to think about moving? Some of you might be able to relate. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of stressful. It can be overwhelming. So Monday evening, I was feeling kind of stressed. That's part one of my story. I'll pick up the second part here in a few moments. But first, I want to write this or read this again where Jesus shows up in the room. You see, they were not alone for long. (laughs) And neither are you. Or rather, you don't have to be. (laughs) Jesus shows up. And he shows up to say, peace be with you. Not just be cool, but shalom be with you. What is shalom? It means completeness, wholeness. It's a Hebrew word that gets translated peace in English. But peace is so kind of underwhelming for the strength of what the word really means, which is things are set right. Things are set right. Mm. And when things aren't, it's easy to be anxious. And they were not only grieving the loss of their friend Jesus, their rabbi, their mentor, at a young age of 33, but they were, they were f- afraid they too would be scooped up and executed. That's real. You see, they had been charged basically with leading a revolution. So he says, peace be with you. And once they had peace, Clarence Haynes says it like this, they could begin to fulfill their purpose. Once they had his peace, they could move on in their purpose. And their purpose was to help establish what he really came to set up, which was not a governmental uh, uh, structure like we understand government. We need government but to set up a spiritual kingdom that would have practical implications in people's lives and for all of society, bringing his character and his ways. So now, after the resurrection, he spends 40 days catching them up on the real plan. He had taught them some of the character pieces. He had shown them by his life and his actions, the people that he cares about who are in the margins, the people that society would step on and step away, or push away, Forced them to step away. They, he had showed them what he's all about. He even would say, if you've seen me, you've seen Abba. You're seeing my character. It is the same as God's. So you see me and you see God. He was defining, describing, and demonstrating what God is really like. His love, his unconditional love, his justice, his righteousness. None of these are absent from his character. We tend to want to choose part of his character over another. Jesus is like, no, it's the whole enchilada. All of this is God. And so he'd been showing and teaching and and explaining that his kingdom was about the least among us and, and even about us. Those who are willing to be last will be first. First will be last. His kingdom turns things upside down. It's kind of an upside down kingdom in terms of the power of man, which wants to rule over where Jesus comes to serve under and his kingdom comes up. (laughs) His kingdom is one of kindness, love, justice, personal holiness, but not trying to be judgmental towards others. Once they had peace, Clarence Hayne says, they could move on in their purpose. Jesus that very day begins to unpack the Word of God. It says in one of the other Gospels that he, he ends up on one of the uh, roads to another village. It's called Emmaus. And two of the disciples didn't even know Jesus was 
risen yet. And they're walking there, talking about what had happened, just bewildered. And Jesus is kind of like hanging out with them, walking and starts unpacking scripture, which the only scripture that he would have had to unpack is what we call the Old Testament. He's unpacking and revealing and showing them himself in story after story after story after story. I have to think he even opened Isaiah 53 and shared it. And they had to be going, whoa, such a description of the day of the cross. By the end of the day, by dinner time, they knew who he was. They ran back to Jerusalem. We've seen him too. We've seen him too. He really is alive. He really is risen. It's true for us all here. It's true for you online and in this room. His peace for your life is for his purposes in your life. To be a kingdom together for worship and for impact. We see that in John chapter 5. I want to, actually it's Revelation, but John's writing it, so that's why I said John, but it's Revelation 5. Why does he want us to move on in our purpose? Because he has plans for us. Oh yeah, I want to come back and finish my story. So Monday around 5 o'clock, I didn't know But Jan had texted a friend to pray because we were feeling some stress around the apartment thing. I didn't know about that text for prayer. But what I do know that happened to me is that I'm I'm on, on Zillow. Anybody here use Zillow? And I'm on the regular app, and and it has a tab for rentals, but there was nothing. I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. And uh, of course, at this point, Jan had mentioned something about a house, and so I was like, oh, a house. Yeah, maybe there's a house for rent. That doesn't seem possible, but sure enough, there weren't any. And then I'm like, wait a minute. Is this, I don't know. And then I don't even know why I did it, but I I Googled Zillow rental. I was just on Zillow. (laughs) But I did it, and I I, I did it, and and what came up was an app called Zillow rental. There's a different app. (laughs) I pull up the app, and the first place that shows up I I zoom in on it, you know how you do with your fingers on your iPad or on a phone, and I'm zooming in on it, and and I get my reading glasses. (laughs) Thank you for everybody that can relate. (laughs) Everybody else was laughing at us, but that's okay. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, our landlady left our apartment. Why would she do that? She's selling it. Wait, we've been renting it. Wait, maybe it's the new owner. Wait, wait. Oh, that's not our address. That's the next door over. (laughs) The house next door is for rent. It's a standalone house, two bedroom, two and a half bath. Nice open space to be able to entertain and have you guys over. I'm like, what? I run up the stairs. I show it to Jan. She grabs the phone. She calls the guy. He says, oh, Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you this. In the corner on the app, it said listed one hour. <laughs> the power of prayer, God at work to bring peace so we can live out our purpose. <laughs> he says, oh, I already have somebody coming to see it tomorrow at 5. Jan said, what about the morning? He said, oh, yeah, that could work. I dropped my kid off at school, and I could be there by 8 o'clock. What time do you leave? Well, it's perfect. (laughs) The commute isn't that long. (laughs) At 8 o'clock, 7.59, we walked out our door. We walked over, went up two stairs, and walked in the door. By 8.30, we'd shaken hands. And by evening, we'd signed a lease. Look at God. Come on. Boom. What he does. (laughs) Why do I tell that story? The power of prayer. The fact that God wants to give us shalom in our life. He's not going to treat me more special than you. Believe it or not, he's not going to treat me more special than you. We are equal in his eyes. We are all parts of the body He distributes the parts of the body the way that he wants to. 
but we're a unit. That's all in 1 Corinthians 12. This diverse unit to accomplish so much good in society together. Peace for our purpose. What do you mean this diverse unity? Well, let's look at John's vision in Revelation 5, starting in verse 6. John says, now at this point, before I read that, he's an old man. He's the only one of the 12 that dies a natural death, that lives out his years. And he's probably in his late 90s or so when he's writing this. And he says, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, like a a sacrificial lamb, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Skipping down to verse 7. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Abba sits on the throne. This one looking like a slain lamb is Jesus. And Jesus is the only one worthy to open the scroll that basically unfolds the end of the game. And what happens is, now those that are gathered around the throne, they begin to worship. They begin to worship. In fact, there's those holding these bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. All of our prayers go before God like incense. That's why the symbolism in the temple of the prayer of, of, of the incense altar burning before the Holy of Holies. It says in verse 9, Then all of these gathered around the throne. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. In fact, some of the early manuscripts of this part of John's letter don't say will reign, they say reign present tense, and they reign on the earth. What does reigning on the earth mean for Jesus' kingdom? It means loving the king and loving people with all our hearts. It means showing his character and his ways. And whenever we, the church, or believers in Jesus, or followers of Jesus, are off track with that plan, we're out of, we're out of the kingdom way. So what he's talking about is he's giving us shalom personally, lifting from us the burden and weight of our sins, but he went to the cross for that in order that we would be included in his family. Now, covered with the blood of Jesus, our sins are no longer seen. We're hidden with Christ, the Bible says. The Father sees Jesus when he sees you if you are in Christ. We're now hidden with Christ, but we're not just saved for our own personal glory and gain. We're saved to be part of a collective called a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. That's what it just said there, that he paid with his blood for a people, for a one new humanity people, Ephesians 2, who will be the kind of body of believers, Jews and nations, together as one under Jesus... Worshippers, a priesthood. That's what he says, a priesthood, which is worshipers and those who will lead others in worship. And a kingdom, which means an impact people making all the difference that's in his heart to be made in the earth. Why is there suffering in the earth? Because the church is anemic. As the church grows and lives out his character, things will change. It's his plan. And he said this about his kingdom. He said it's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of seeds. But when it's planted, it grows to become the largest of trees in the garden, and even the birds find shade in it. His kingdom is different. His kingdom is an inside job. <laughs> it's not powering over. It's serving with a towel wrapped around your waist, like at the Seder meal with his disciples Thursday night when he was arrested. He washed their feet. We can't even understand something like that. <laughs> that would be so weird. <laughs> but they lived in dusty times. <laughs> Some of my friends living out in the country, or my sister, 
and her family in North Georgia and Tennessee, they might be able to explain it to me. I don't know. That's not a stereotype. I'm saying it's warmer down there and they live outside differently. And up here, how many times are we barefoot? Rarely. If somebody's barefoot up here, we're like, what's wrong with that guy? But culturally, all over the world, most of the world has a, a sense of it. And so that idea of taking a towel and, and, and stooping at your feet and a basin and washing your feet, it makes sense as an act of service because our feet are dusty from walking outside. Even though we're wearing sandals, we're getting dusty feet. Much of the world has that experience. We don't, but much of the world does. That's what his kingdom is like. He said, do this with each other. Love each other like that. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? One of the spiritual leaders, teachers of the law, was asking. Jesus had an answer. And he said, love God with all your heart, your soul and mind. But then he added, and the second command is this, love your neighbor as yourself. And he took these out of the Torah. Jesus brought forward these principles because they are what his kingdom essence is all about. Finally, this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul, who'd studied under Gamaliel, one of the preeminent rabbis of that day. Paul, a Jewish man from Tarsus, whose name had been Saul until he met Jesus and then his name was changed. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 8, it reads like this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, as absolute priority. I gave this to you, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And remember, when he says scriptures, he's talking about what we call the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament yet. The Gospels weren't written yet at the time when Jesus was teaching. When they were teaching about Jesus, there weren't Gospels until later. When they realized, oh, he's not coming back yet. <laughs> we need to write this stuff down. Well, he couldn't come back yet. The job wasn't finished. It still isn't. A people for himself, which he's purchased from every tribe, every tongue, every language, every nation. Until there's full representation and until his character and his ways are being lived out by his people in the earth, he's not coming for his bride. But then he will come. That's in Matthew 24, 14, if you're wondering. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas was the, I think the Latin or the Greek or the Aramaic for Peter, I don't remember. He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Paul, when he's writing this letter to the Corinthian church from the city of Ephesus, all... <laughs> He knows in his mind as he's writing, there are people still alive who saw Jesus after his resurrection. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. And the reason he says as one abnormally born because he wasn't a part of that 120. He wasn't a part of that 500. He was persecuting the early church. He was persecuting them because he saw them as a sect, a breakaway from Judaism. He didn't, he didn't realize what he was doing was actually persecuting Jesus, the son of the living God. And so Jesus appears to him, Saul, and says, I know you're trying to do good, but you're hurting me. And that's his Damascus Road experience, his calling 
It comes from a personal visit from Jesus, the resurrected Lord. And so he says, I'm, I'm a little different than them, but I too saw him. Then in verse 12, he says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? That idea or that fear or that doubt creeps into the church at different times. Even in the early church, it did. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. There is a resurrection from the dead. It is coming. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Whoa! Then those who have died or fallen asleep, they used to say, in Christ are lost. If only for this life, if only for this life, we have hope in Christ. We are of all people to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or died. He's the first fruits of those who die. For since death came through a man, one man, Adam, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die because of sin, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, and then we, and then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Ephesians 6 says these dominions and powers are in the spiritual realm. We don't see them, but they're at work in the evil that happens in the earth. But they're going to be brought under submission to Jesus. For he must reign. He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. He must reign. And what did it say in Revelation 5 verses 9 and 10? It said, he's purchased for himself a people from every tribe and tongue who will be a priesthood and a kingdom and they will reign in the earth. We're his body. It's not like we reign for ourselves or for our glory or in our power. It's through his power in us and the headship is Jesus. He's the head of his body. Yeah. And then it says this, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Oh, oh, oh. It's resurrection Sunday, guys. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. There will be life. There will be a resurrection of life because Jesus was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for your obedience to go to the cross to suffer a death like that, to pay the price, to let there be justice for the sins that we've committed. The justice of God was satisfied on the cross in you. You willingly accepted that into yourself on our behalf, becoming a substitute for us, where we deserve death for our sins. You took the death for us. And then, Father, you didn't let him stay in the grave. You didn't even let his, his, his flesh begin to decay. Instead, on the third day, you raised him from the death, shattering the power of death and of the tomb. And now, your word says that for those who are in Christ because they've believed in him, because they have given their life to him through repentance and believing, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in us by your Holy Spirit. 
That's the story of Easter. And we thank you for it. With heads still bowed for a moment, I first want to speak to those of us who would agree we need peace. We need shalom. We're in kind of an anxious time or maybe a dark time. And I'd like to pray for you. If you'd be willing to slip your hand up, I want to just see you and be able to pray for you. I'm looking around the room. Okay? 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 Father, each one that slipped their hand up, fill their life. Fill their life with a peace past any kind of understanding. Be at work in their situation. Be at work in their body. Be at work in their family. In Jesus' name, bring shalom. With heads still bowed for a moment, I want to give a chance for any of us who we have not yet repented for our sins and decided, Jesus, you are who you say you are. I believe in you. You are the son of the living God. Maybe you're here and you haven't taken those two steps to repent and believe. I'd like to pray with you too. Actually, I'd like to just pray a prayer that you pray with me from your heart. Father, just pray it from your own heart. I want to believe in your son. I want to repent for the things that I've done that have grieved you. I want to experience the forgiveness that lifts the weight of my sin, the burden of my guilt. I want to say thank you to you, Jesus, that you paid that price for me that I deserve because of my sin, because of the injustices that I've done. I want to say thank you to you, Jesus. Would you be king of my life and Lord and Savior? And it's in your name we pray. Hallelujah. Can we celebrate for everyone that made that their prayer today? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.